I just want to go through some quick criticisms of Mill's uh, utilitarianism, and we're going to have a look at quality and his, his, his rule utilitarianism. One criticism of rule utilitarianism is that it either collapses into act utilitarianism, or if it doesn't, it's incoherent. A thought goes, imagine rule utilitarianism prescribes a rule that says don't tell lies, right? Because not telling lies uh, generally maximizes the good. That's an entirely plausible thing that rule utilitarianism could say. But you find yourself in a situation where breaking the rule and telling a lie would, in this case, be the act that maximizes utility. Imagine, for example, a Nazi comes to your door and asks if you're hiding Jews in your house, which it turns out you are. Here you have two choices. Strong rule utilitarianism says that you should keep the rules no matter what. Weak rule utilitarianism says that you can break the rules when doing so would better maximise utility. The problem uh, with strong rule utilitarianism is that it's incoherent, it's irrational, because strictly following the rules sometimes results in great disaster and a failure to maximise utility, which is the whole point of utilitarianism, right? It's to maximise utility. So in our example, it will lead to you telling the Nazis, yes, I do have Jews here, potentially resulting in their deaths. Joseph Fletcher of, of Situation Ethics, he would call such people legalists, right? They blindly follow rules. Uh, even even if doing so creates more harm. The problem with weak rule utilitarianism is that it collapses into act utilitarianism. Because if you're prepared to break the rules in order to maximise utility, right, we're effectively being an act utilitarian because we're assessing each individual situation and calculating whether following the rule would maximise utilitarian would maximise utility, or if some alternative action that breaks the rule would maximise utility instead, and then going for whichever action best maximises utility. Well, basically, it's an act utilitarian. Now, one way to respond to this criticism comes from the, the utilitarian Brad Hooker, a contemporary defender of rule utilitarianism, and he says that we ought to break the rules only when doing so is necessary to prevent disaster. So if he's not a strong, or he's not a weak rule utilitarian, but he, he's somewhere in between these two positions. You shouldn't break a rule whenever breaking it would produce marginally more utility. Don't do that. But you should break the rule in order to prevent disaster. The Jews getting killed uh, because you want to avoid lying, that would be a disaster. Therefore, in this case, you are morally permitted to lie. But why not still just be an act utilitarian? Well, as we saw in my video on objections to Bentham's utilitarianism, act utilitarianism is hugely demanding. It's hugely demanding because you have to maximise utility all the time. Hooker argues that rule utilitarianism is a better option because it's much less demanding. He says that moral codes must be learnable, right? They must be simple, easy to remember rules that we can remember, we can remember them and we can apply them. If the rules are too complicated, we fail to maximise utility because we fail to remember or to implement them correctly. Act utilitarianism will fail to maximise utility in practice because people find it too demanding. Therefore, we ought to promote rule utilitarianism with simple rules everyone can learn and follow, but with a clause that says we ought to break the rules in order to prevent disaster. Right, so we don't have to go through with rule, this version of rule utilitarianism, we don't have to go through the hustle and bustle of trying to work out which actions marginally increase its utility over others. We just have simple, easy to remember rules we can implement, and they're generally, they're, they're going to tend to maximise a utility. They're going to do a very good job that's trying to work out with each individual action anyway. Um, but we have this thing where when it's really obviously following the rules is going to be a bad thing to do, like people are going to die, when it's really obvious that disaster is going to happen, and that's quite clear to us, then we say, oh, okay, fine, no, forget about the rules, clearly that would be a stupid thing to do, uh, let's break the rules in this circumstance. But if in any other circumstance we're not really sure, we just carry on with the easy to remember rules, so that's, the, that's the claim that Hooker makes. So Hooker suggests this is the most realistic way to maximise utility. So some critics argue that Mill's addition of quality to the measure of pleasures and pains overcomplicates Bentham's more simplistic calculus. Therefore, it's a step backwards from Bentham's quantitative utilitarianism. But this seems to assume that Bentham's calculus is simple, which perhaps it isn't. So Wendy Donner has pointed out uh, that Bentham's measure of pleasure and pains is more complicated than it may at first seem. So first of all, quantity is composed of uh, at least intensity and duration, right? It's not just one one thing. And you, you might suddenly think, oh yeah, but there are there are actually there's more than that because there's more things in the hedonic or the philosophic calculus than that. But if you think about it, it's only intensity and duration that actually measure the individual experience, how pleasurable, how painful it is. Fecundity, for instance, that doesn't actually measure that 
how pleasurable the experience is. That's, an, that's something else. Uh, so, so quantity is not a single thing. It's composed of intensity and duration. And, and Bentham argues that these two things should be given equal weight, but that's not entirely clear that it should be. Um, we may sometimes prefer short, intense pleasures to, to more drawn out, less intense pleasures, even if overall that pleasure uh, would, would be a higher quantity. So there are issues there, it's not entirely as simple as, as it first seems. Mill does appear to be right about pleasures and pains being of different kinds of quality. The pain of a sunburn feels different to the pain of a toothache. And the pleasure of achieving something great feels different to the pleasure of an orgasm. And even if we thought that an orgasm produced a greater quantity of pleasure than a great achievement, we might still think it important to work towards our achievements than to have sex all the time. We could also criticise Mill's distinction between higher and lower pleasures. So higher pleasures are those that utilise our uniquely human faculties, whereas lower pleasures are more bodily sensations. Pleasures we share with animals. Mill appears to suggest that we ought to prefer higher pleasures over lower pleasures, even when the higher pleasure produces a lower quantity of pleasure. But is reading a good philosophy book really better than, say, sex? If we think that it isn't, we seem to be disagreeing with Mill's analysis. We might think that lower pleasures sometimes are preferable to higher pleasures. Mill has a few things to say about this, and one suggestion is that people sometimes go for lower pleasures over higher pleasures because lower pleasures are often more accessible. Right? So they're easier to attain. So I might get more pleasure out of reading a book, or I could go home and play FIFA all evening like I have all week. Now, FIFA doesn't require the same mental energy as reading a book, so it's an easier pleasure, but it might not necessarily be higher than something like, you know, improving my intellectual prowess uh, by reading, reading a book. But an another way to respond to this criticism is to argue that pleasures are often accompanied by second-order pleasures. What we mean is that when we have a pleasurable experience, um, we also have a second-order attitude towards that experience, and these second-order attitudes involve our higher faculties. So let us use the example of pain and second-order pain, so it's a little bit easier so that we get on the right track here. So if we have a painful and degrading experience, the pain from the experience is one thing, but our second-order attitudes, right, our feelings of humiliation and upset about the experience, that's another pain, and that can be enduring, right? When the actual painful experience has ended, we still have those second order attitudes a long time uh, in the future, perhaps, uh, especially if it's, if it's particularly traumatic. So likewise, you know, sex doesn't have to be a surrendering of rationality to our animalistic impulsive desires, although sometimes it could be. Uh, but sex is also vulnerable and emotional. It's having the confidence and trust to give over your, your pleasure to, to someone else, to someone special, to someone you love. And it's not just the sole phys physical experience of pleasure, right? There's a whole other realm dimension of pleasure that involves our higher faculties, our connection, our emotional connection with someone else. And this is what distinguishes us from animals and their, and their lower pleasures. So there are ways uh, in which what are seemingly lower pleasures um, actually involve, can involve higher faculties uh, that, can, that, can, that can better defend Mill's distinction when we bring in these, these second order attitudes.